professionally? Because I've actually had an increasing number of young people say to me that they have huge uncertainty about whether the thing they're studying now will matter at all. A lawyer, uh, an accountant. And I don't know what to say to these people. I don't know what to say. Because I, I believe that the rate of improvement in, in AI is going to continue. And therefore, imagining any rate of improvement, it gets to the point where, I'm not being funny, but all these white-collar jobs will be done by an AI, an AI or an AI agent. Yeah. So there was a television series called Humans. In Humans, we have extremely capable humanoid robots doing everything. And at one point, the parents are talking to their teenage daughter, who's very, very smart. And the parents are saying, oh, you know, maybe you should go into medicine. And the daughter says, you know, why would I bother? It'll take me seven years to qualify. It takes the robot seven seconds to learn. So nothing I do matters. And is that how you feel about... So I think that's, that's a future that, uh, in fact, that is the future that we are moving towards. I don't think it's a future that everyone wants. That is what is being uh, created for us right now. So in that future, assuming that, you know, e even if we get halfway, right, in the sense that, okay, perhaps not surgeons, perhaps not you know, great violinists. There'll be pockets where perhaps humans will remain good at it. Where? The kinds of jobs where you hire people by the hundred will go away. Okay. Where people are in some sense exchangeable, that you, you, you just need lots of them. And, uh, you know, when, when half of them quit, you just fill up those, those slots with more people. In some sense, those are jobs where we're using people as robots. And that's a, sort of, that's a sort of strange conundrum here, right? That, you know, I imagine the writing science fiction 10,000 years ago, right? When we're all hunter-gatherers and I'm this little science fiction author and I'm describing this future where, you know, there are going to be these giant windowless boxes and you're going to go in, you know, you'll, you'll travel for miles and you'll go into this windowless box and you'll do the same thing 10,000 times for the whole day, and then you'll leave and travel for miles to go home. You're talking about this podcast. And then you're going to go back and do it again. And you would do that every day of your life until you die. The office. And people would say, yeah, you're nuts, right? There's no way that we humans are ever going to have a future like that, because that's awful, right? But that's exactly the future that we ended up with, with, with office buildings and factories, where many of us go and do the same thing thousands of times a day, and we do it thousands of days in a row. Uh, and then we die. And we need to figure out what is the next phase going to be like. And in particular, how in that world do we have the incentives to become fully human? Which I think means at least the level of education that people have now, and probably more. Because I think to live a really rich life, you need a better understanding of yourself, of the world, uh, than most people get in their current educations. What, what is it to be human? To It's to reproduce, to pursue stuff, to go in the pursuit of difficult things. You know, we used to hunt on the... Mm. To attain goals, right? It's always, if I wanted to climb Everest, the last thing I would want is someone to pick me up on a helicopter and stick me on the top. So we'll, we'll voluntarily pursue hard things. So although I could get the robot to build me a ranch in, on this plot of land, I will choose to do it because the pursuit itself is rewarding. Yes. We're kind of seeing that anyway, aren't we? Don't you think we're seeing a bit of that in society where life got so comfortable that now people are like obsessed with running marathons and doing these crazy endurance? And, and, and learning to cook complicated things when they could just, you know, have them delivered. Um, yeah, no, I think there's, there's real value in the ability to do things and the doing of those things. And I think, you know, the, the obvious danger is the Wall-E world where everyone just consumes entertainment, uh, which doesn't require much education and doesn't lead to a rich, satisfying life, I think, in the long run. A lot of people will choose that world. I think some, yeah, some people may. There's also, I mean, you know, whether you're consuming entertainment or whether you're doing something, you know, cooking or painting, or whatever, because it's fun and interesting to do, What's missing from that, right? All of that is purely selfish. I think one of the reasons we work is because we feel valued. We feel like we're benefiting other people. 
And I think some, I remember having this conversation with um, a lady in England who helps to run the hospice movement. And the people who work in the hospices where, you know, the, the patients are literally there to die are largely volunteers. So they're not doing it to get paid. But they find it incredibly rewarding to be able to spend time with people who are in their last weeks or months to give them company and happiness. So I actually think that interpersonal roles will be much, much more important in future. So if I was going to advise my kids, not that they would ever listen, but if, I, if my kids would listen and, I, and, and wanted to know what I thought would be you know, valued careers in future, I think it would be these interpersonal roles based on an understanding of human needs, psychology. There are some of those roles right now. So obviously, you know, therapists and psychiatrists and so on. But that, that's a very much a sort of asymmetric role, right? Where one person is suffering and the other person is trying to alleviate the suffering. You know, and then there are things like, they call them executive coaches or life coaches, right? That's a, a less asymmetric role where someone is trying to uh, help another person live a better life, whether it's a better life in their work role or, or just uh, how they live their life in general. And so I could imagine that those kinds of roles will expand dramatically. There's this interesting paradox that exists when life becomes easier, um, which shows that abundance consistently pushes society societies towards more individualism because once survival pressures disappear people prioritize things differently they prioritize freedom comfort self-expression over things like sacrifice or um family formation and we're seeing i think in the west already a decline in people having kids because there's more material abundance fewer kids people are getting married and committing to each other and having relationships later and more infrequently because generally, once we have more abundance, we don't want to complicate our lives. Um, and at the same time, as you said earlier, that abundance breeds a, an inability to find meaning, a sort of shallowness to everything. This is one of the things I think a lot about, and I'm, I'm in the process now of writing a book about it, which is this idea that individualism was act is a bit of a lie. Like when I say individualism and freedom, I mean like the narrative at the moment amongst my generation is you like be your own boss and stand on your own two feet and we're having less kids and we're not getting married and it's all about me, 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 me. Yeah, that last part is where it goes wrong. Yeah, and it's um, like almost a narcissistic society where yeah. me, 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 my self-interest first. And when you look at mental health outcomes and loneliness and all these kinds of things, it's going in a horrific direction, but at the same time, we're freer than ever. It seems like that, you know, it seems like there's a, we should, there's a, maybe another story about dependency, which is not sexy, like depend on each other. Oh, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think, you know, happiness is not available from consumption or even lifestyle, right? I think happiness is, arises from giving. It can be you, through the work that you do, you can see that other people benefit from that, or it could be in direct interpersonal relationships. There is an invisible tax on salespeople that no one really talks about enough. The mental load of remembering everything, like meeting notes, timelines, and everything in between. Until we started using our sponsor's product called PipeDrive, one of the best CRM tools for small and medium-sized business owners. The idea here was that it might alleviate some of the unnecessary cognitive overload that my team was carrying, so that they could spend less time in the weeds of admin and more time with clients, in-person meetings, and building relationships. PipeDrive has enabled this to happen. It's such a simple but effective CRM that automates the tedious, repetitive, and time-consuming parts of the sales process. And now our team can nurture those leads and still have bandwidth to focus on the higher priority tasks that actually get the deal over the line. Over 100,000 companies across 170 countries already use Pipedrive to grow their business, and I've been using it for almost a decade now. Try it free for 30 days. No credit card needed, no payment needed. Just use my link, pipedrive.com slash CEO to get started today. That's pipedrive.com slash CEO. Where does the rewards of this AI race, where, do, where does it accrue to? 
I think a lot about this in terms of like universal basic income. If you have these five, six, seven, ten massive AI companies that are going to win the fifteen quadrillion dollar prize, mm-hmm. and they're going to automate all of the professional pursuits that we we currently have, all of our jobs are going to go away. Who who gets all the money, and how do how do we get some of it back? <laughs> money actually doesn't matter, right? What what matters is the production of goods and services. Uh, and then how those are distributed. And so, so money acts as a way to facilitate the distribution and um, exchange of those goods and services. If all production is concentrated um, in the hands of a, of a few companies, right, that sure, they will lease some of their robots to us. You know, we, we want a school in our village. They lease the robots to us. The robots build the school, they go away. We have to pay a certain amount of, of money for that. But where do we get the money? Right? If we are not producing anything, then uh, we don't have any money unless there's some redistribution mechanism. And as you mentioned, so universal basic income is, it seems to me, an admission of failure. Because what it says is, okay, we're just going to give everyone the money and then they can use the money to pay the AI company to lease the robots to build the school. And then we'll have a school and that's good. Um, but what, it's an admission of failure because it says we can't work out a system in which people have any worth or any economic role, right? So 99% of the global population is, from an economic point of view, useless. Can I ask you a question? If you had a button in front of you and pressing that button would stop all progress in artificial intelligence right now and forever. Would you press it? That's a very interesting question. Um, If it's either or, either I do it now or it's too late and we careen into some uncontrollable future, perhaps, yeah, because I'm not super optimistic that we're heading in the right direction at all. So I put that button in front of you now, it stops all AI progress, shuts down all the AI companies immediately globally, and none of them can reopen. You press it. Well, here's here's what I think should happen. So obviously, you know, I've been doing AI for 50 years. um, And the original motivations, which is that AI can be a power tool for humanity, enabling us to do more and better things than we can unaided. I think that's still valid. The problem is the kinds of AI systems that we're building are not tools. They are replacements. In fact, you can see this very clearly because we create them literally as the closest replicas we can make of human beings. The technique for creating them is called imitation learning. So we observe human verbal behavior, writing or speaking, and we make a system that imitates that as well as possible. So what we are making is imitation humans, at least in the verbal sphere. And so of course they're going to replace us. They're not tools. So you would press the button. So I say, I think there is another course, which is use and develop AI as tools, tools for science, tools for economic organization and so on, Um, but not as replacements for human beings. What I like about this question is it forces you to go into into probabilities. Yeah, so, and and that's, that's why I'm reluctant because I don't, I don't agree with the, you know, what's your probability of doom, mm. right? your so-called P of doom uh, number, because that makes sense if you're an alien. You know, you're in, you're in a bar with some other aliens and you're looking down at the earth and you're taking bets on, you know, are these humans going to make a mess of things and go extinct because they develop AI? So it's fine for those aliens to bet on, on that. But if you're a human, then you're not just betting, you're actually acting. 
there, there's an element to this though, which I guess where probabilities do come back in, which is you also have to weigh when I give you such a binary decision, um, the probability of us pursuing the more nuanced, safe approach into that equation. So you're, you're, uh, the, the, the maths in my head is, okay, you've got all the upsides here and then you've got potential downsides. And then there's a probability of, do I think we're actually going to course correct based on everything I know, based on the incentive structure of human beings and, and countries? And then if there's, e but then you could go, if there's even a 1% chance of extinction, is it even worth all these upsides? Yeah, and I, I would argue, no. I mean, maybe maybe what we would say, if, if we said, okay, it's going to stop the progress for 50 years. You'd press it. And during those 50 years, we can work on how do we do AI in a way that's guaranteed to be safe and beneficial? How do we organize our societies to flourish uh, in conjunction with extremely capable AI systems? So we haven't answered either of those questions. And I don't think we want anything resembling AGI until we have completely solid answers to both of those questions. So if there was a button where I could say, all right, we're going to pause progress for 50 years, Yes, I would do it. But if that button was in front of you, you're going to make a decision either way. Either you don't press it or you press it. I know. If, yeah, so if that, if that button is there, stop it for 50 years, I would say yes. Stop it forever. Not yet. I think, I think there's still a decent chance that we can pull out. <laughs> 